power of Christ I'll stand in Christ alone in Christ alone it's is Christ alone that we stand without him he is our all in all and through him we stand but we say oh well you know I've been good go to church every Sunday pay my tithes do good deeds in the neighborhood and say God bless you to people I'm, I'm a good person that's not enough it has to be in Christ alone it has to be in Christ alone you see it doesn't matter what we do or how we do it it's not enough because we can't earn our way into the kingdom it is through Christ alone it is through Christ alone because salvation is given to us by the grace of God it is by the grace of God that we have been saved Philippians 2 5 not of anything that we've done on ourselves but it is a gift from God so you see it is through Christ alone and we wonder well where's the gift I mean it, the gift that gift of salvation you know it's nothing I tangible nothing I can see but it is folks it is it is the gift of God and what was the gift the gift was Christ the one in which we stand remember for God so loved the world that he gave and then John tells us that unless we go through him we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven only through Christ we have to go through Christ and Jesus confirms that himself in that same book John 14 and 6 he says no one gets to the father except by me we have to go by him he is the only way I am the way the truth and the life he says so it is through Christ alone and that's where we have to take our stand in Christ alone I believe in Jesus Christ that he is the son of God who died for my sins and rose again and now seated at the right hand of the father interceding on my behalf that's where we have to plant ourselves we can't come up with all of the good stuff that we do it's, it's not pertinent in your journey it must be through Christ alone and I know everybody knows that but sometimes you just need to remind people so that it'll stay in the forefronts of our mind so that we can get back to business get back to the basics that is following Jesus Christ Okay, so the day is the third Sunday of the month, and as you know, I get questions, and on the third Sundays, I answer those questions. So there are three by five cards on the back of the chairs. If you have a biblical question, you can jot it down on this and put it in one of the receptacles by the exit doors, and then they will give it to me, and then the third Sunday of the month, I will answer that question. So I have a question this morning, and the question is, fearing God or God-fearing? Meaning what? Scared? Scared of or God within me? Are we scared of God when we have, say we are fearing God? Or does it mean that God is in us? And it says sometimes we say that I am a God-fearing man or woman. So the question is, what does that mean when we say that we are a God-fearing person? Does it mean that we are afraid of God? Are we scared of God? Well, in the Bible, you will find more times than anything else, I believe. Some people say that it is in the Bible 365 times. But that's not so factually. But it is in there a lot. Fear not. Or be not afraid. Or 
I hope there's another. Fear not, be not afraid, and uh, I am with you. Something. Anyway, but all of those put together still don't come to the 365. But it's in there a lot of times. So it is the point being that God does not want us to be afraid. To have fear is to eliminate faith. When you are afraid, then faith vanishes. Or when you have doubt. Doubt and fear wipes out faith. So we are not to fear. And that's why I believe it's in there so many times. So that we can build our our confidence and our faith in Christ up. Because if we trust in God and believe in Him, then what can man do to us? Because we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. So we are victorious in everything that we do through Christ. So we should fear not. Fear not. So fear, the meaning of fear, everybody knows what fear is. Or do we? Because we experience fear. Fear is terror, fright, that affection of the mind that arises on the conception of approaching danger. Scared. Afraid, meaning state of fear, fright, or panic. That's your definition through the dictionary. That fear is an affection. It affects your mind because you conceive danger, you fear. And it causes terror. And some people use the phrase that you reach that stage of fight or flight. Yeah, run or fight. But the fear of the Lord is a whole other different subject. The fear of the Lord is assuming a relationship of love. Assuming a relationship of love to the point that you are prompted not to offend God. That prompting comes from the Holy Spirit prompting your soul again. Knowing that you are his. And it creates obedience. You don't want to offend God. So you want to do what is right. To endeavor in all things to please him. This is produced again in the soul by the Holy Spirit. And great blessings are pro- pronounced upon those who follow or who possess these Christian traits. So by having the fear of the Lord, you will be blessed because you will want to please him and you will do all of the things that you think is right because you do not want to offend God. I would like for you to come with me so that we can seek this out and experience the meaning through example, in the book of Psalms, chapter 34, beginning at verse 9, it says, O fear the Lord, you his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do like and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come, you children. Hearken unto me, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Now that one is is part of the God character in us. Just want to stop for a minute. Everybody wants to live a long life and see good stuff. If you ever noticed a restaurant with a big line out of it, you automatically say, the food must be good in there because everybody's going there. Everybody wants something good. That is the God character in us because God withholds no good thing from us. So the God character in us wants good. So we gravitate towards good, even though they may say, I don't even believe in God. I don't worship God. But they still want something good because you have to understand God created everybody. So there is some God in everybody. 
So everybody gravitates towards good. This is great. And then he goes on to, to explain to us. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Now David wrote this Psalms. David wrote this Psalms. But but we want to go in and kind of dissect it and look at it and see what he's trying to do here. David wrote this song because he condensed a life's lesson into six verses. Those six verses we just read. So letting you know that you are no longer sinners. That's the first thing he said, if you recall in, in the reading. In verse 9, he said, O oh, for the Lord, ye his sinners, his, <laughs> you his saints. He's letting us know we're no longer sinners. That's the first thing that he points out, that we are no longer sinners because we fear the Lord. So if you fear the Lord, you are a saint. You're no longer a sinner. You've been consecrated, which is set aside for the service of God, which is the definition of holy, to be set apart for the service of God. This is holy. And holy is to be sanctified. Thus, you're saints. So he wants us to get that part down, that we are no longer sinners. And then he uses what he knows best, and that is the shepherd and the sheep theory, that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He says that when you become a fearful person of the Lord, you are in the tutelage of God, meaning you belong to God. God is going to look after you. And because you've placed yourself in his care and you're following him, then he will take care of you. It says that there is no want to them that fear him. Those who have committed themselves to Christ, there is no want in them. Because he is their shepherd now. And the always takes care to worry about what they're going to eat, where they're going to eat, where they're going to get a drink, where they're going next. All they have to do is follow the shepherd. All of their needs are met. So this is what he's pointing out to us, that all of our needs will be met if we follow God. Again, he wrote that in the 23rd Psalms, if you recall. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down. See, he takes care of me and all of the things that I want. So as a child of God, we will want for no good thing. He will always provide our needs. Remember what he says. Cast your cares on me, I'll care for you. And the Lord will provide all of your needs through his riches and glory. So David is pointing up to us. And because of that godly character, we desire good and wholesome lives filled with good things. David, he, David, he gets Christ-like here in verse 11 when he says to us in verse 11, he says, Come, you children, listen unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. He wants to teach us the fear of the Lord. What is he doing here? He is trying to ensure us of our position in Christ. He wants to teach us. So we will understand that we have benefits in Christ by fearing Christ. He wants us to stand, wants us to understand that our way can get the way we can get to them is by being in the will of God. The will having a twofold meaning, the will of God, meaning we inherit from God. When somebody dies, they leave you a will, you get good stuff. Plus, you want to be operating in the ways of God, the will of God. So that will he's talking about is twofold. And this is what David is pointing out to us. He says, come and let me teach you the fear of the Lord, ensuring us that the only way that we can get the benefits of Christ is by being in his will. Now, did you know, 
Now, here's the, here's the point that David wants us to get in my language, in my terminology. That if you insure your house for a million dollars and then you go out and deliberately burn that house down, you don't get the million dollars. You don't get anything. As a matter of fact, you get arrested. It's your house. You insured it, but you can't burn it down. But if it accidentally burns down, then you're insured, you get the money. And this is what David is saying here. This is why he's bringing these things out to our to our remembrance so that we don't become complacent or we don't begin to compromise and then we will lose our benefits. So he's pointing out to us, this is what you need to know to be in, to be in the fear of God. And he talks about it again in verse 13 where he tells us here, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking guile. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking guile. You see, we have three components here. We have three components. The fear of the Lord. Doing good and rejecting evil. And again, 13 tells us to, to watch that. So we are to watch what we say, the blaspheming, the backbiting, the condemnation, and the lies and deceit. We want to stay away from those. When we say stop them, if we have ventured into those areas, we want to repent and get away from that. If we haven't started it, don't do it. Don't do it. We cannot be in the will of God in those activities. Then verse 14, he goes, he says, depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So he's saying, stay away from evil. Now this one really hurts because some things and some people have to go. But wait a minute, that's my first cousin. We grew up together with you get to make the choice. Either they go or, or they don't. But you can't be in the will of God dealing with evil. And this is what he said. Stay away from evil. And then he goes on to say, stay in an attitude of prayer. Esteem others better than yourself. I did, this, this is hard. This is a big one. Esteeming others better than yourself. Give of yourself. Get involved with the concerns of others. Always with, an encur with the encouragement. Live on the avenue of peace. Live on the avenue of peace. What did he say here? Seek peace and pursue it. Live on the avenue of peace. Remember what Romans 12, 18 says. It says, do everything that is within your power to be at peace with all men. But I don't like, he didn't say whether you like them or not. Again, you get to choose. He said, do everything that you can do to be at peace with all men. That means every man. Every man. So swallow and forgive the guy and move on. And his last thought was looking for peace and chasing after it. Looking for peace and chasing after it. Find peace and pursue it. Seek peace and pursue it. And I want to read to you Matthew 5 and 9. I could say it, but I want to read it because I like for it to come out of the book. In Matthew 5, 9, which is the Beatitudes... He says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. They shall be called what they portray. They look like Jesus. Peace is the absence of enmity 
and the presence of God's salvation. They shall be called the children of God. Peace represents the work of justice, righteousness, reconciliation, and mercy through Christ Jesus. This is why it's important for us to keep the peace. But the fear of God, the fear of God prevents you from doing things your way. It prevents you from doing things your way when you fear God because you don't want to offend him, but you want to be obedient to him. So when you get that idea of what you should do and that little voice says, oh, don't do that, then you should not do that. Or when you decide not to do that and that little voice says, oh, you need to go ahead and do that, then you need to go ahead and do that. That is the fear of God by being obedient and loving him enough not to want to offend him. And in the book of Kings, Second Kings actually, the greatest example of the fear of God through humility is, again, Second Kings 5, Naaman, the Syrian commander of the army. He was a man that had leprosy. And it says that... He heard from a little girl who he had captured from Israel that there was a man in Israel who could cure leprosy. All he had to do was go see this man. So he got together a bunch of gifts and a bunch of money and he went to Israel to see this man. Now he was in the... the captain of the guard of Syria. He stood in the presence of the king. The king leaned on his arm in worship. So he's going now to Israel, to an enemy, to seek help for his leprosy. And he gets to Elijah's house, Elisha's house. And Elijah doesn't even come out and speak to him. He sends the servant out to tell him, go dip yourself in the Jordan River seven times. And Naaman, who again is an influential person, this offends him terribly that the man of God didn't even come out and talk to him, sent a servant out to talk to him and told him to go dip in the Jordan River seven times. So he's angry. And he begins to leave the scene. He's going, and he's going to go back to Syria, really mad. And the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit prompts us when we are to be notified about offending God. Naaman doesn't have that because he doesn't have the fear of God. So he doesn't have the Holy Spirit to prompt him. But what he does have is servants. And his servants begins to speak to him or ask permission to speak to him and they say to him what are you doing you came all of this way to get your healing and now that the man has told you what to do you don't want to do it had he told you something very difficult or something strange to do you would have done that because you want to show how tough you are or how smart you are you would have done that but he just said something as simple as go bathe in the river and you don't want to do it. You don't want to offend him. I hope you understand what it said. To offend him. You don't want to offend him. But you need to do what he said since that's what you come to do. And Naaman is thinking, he's proud. He's thinking that he had offended him by not coming out to speak to him. That's disrespectful. I am the second in command in Syria, the highest person over there, and he won't even speak to me. I expected him to at least come out and speak to me and maybe wave his hands over the affected area and say something to his God, and then I'd be healed. But he wouldn't even come out and talk to me. And now he wants me, again, a man of my caliber, to go and bob up and down in the dirty Jordan River like a clot. 
like a cork. He wants me to bounce up and down in the river like a cork. In that dirty river, we have better rivers in Syria than they have over here. The Obama and the, uh, what's the other, Fofar. Farpar, Farpar and the Abana, they're river clean. If I want to wash, I'd wash it in the rivers, they're clean. But the servant said, just do what the man says. And it says that Damon relented. And he went and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times. And on that seventh time, when he emerged from the water, his skin was clean and it was like a young child's skin. Beautiful. And now he understands and he makes the confession. That confession that we all have to make that there is only one God and that one God is in Israel. His enemy. That one God is in Israel. But he knows now that there's only one God. Conversion came out of his obedience. Plus his health was restored. I'm talking about many blessings come upon those who follow these Christian traits. You see, when we have these ideas of our own, following our own way, we will go astray. Things will not come out the way that we think they should. But when we follow God... He has nothing but good things for those who follow him. The question, fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning, Proverbs says. The beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. What is it telling us? It is telling us that we are getting our minds right when we accept Christ as our Lord. We'll get our minds are right. That is the beginning of wisdom or knowledge. Now we're going to learn the right way to go. And the right way to go is to be in God's will. And as long as we stay in God's will, he will withhold no good thing from us. We will always prosper through Christ. That is the crutch and the balance of the question. So fearing of the Lord is not a bad thing. Fearing of the Lord is a good thing, but fear itself is bad. That's where we have to make that distinction, and this is why we follow Christ. Because he will make that distinction. The Holy Spirit will prompt us to do the right thing. And we say, well, God never speaks to me. Yes, he does. Speaks to you all the time. You just don't listen. Or there's too much noise going on in your environment to where you just don't hear him. But God speaks to us all. Because, again, that Holy Spirit prompting us to do what is right. To follow the will of God because of God's love for us. That grace that we received through the giving of the Son of Jesus Christ. That grace was a gift to us so that we could sustain life and that we would have that life everlasting. So follow Christ and listen to the prompts of the Holy Spirit. And if you have not sought God, if you have not asked God to come into your life and be the Lord of your life and to be your Savior, then that is something that you should do immediately. There is never a better time than now because of God's presence in our life. He is a right now God, and right now is when we should acknowledge and accept Him so that everything that we do from this point on is godly and we are in the will of God. Once you accept Christ and he comes into your life, then he will be the Lord of your life. That is his promise to us. Revelation 3.20 says, Though I stand at the door and knock, he means that he is present with you always. All you have to do is let him into your heart so that he can be with you always. So that is something that we should seek promptly. The fear of the Lord.
making him the Lord of our lives so that we can have those good things and that we don't have to fear anymore. Fear, again, is terror. And terror is suffering. If you know anybody who's afraid, then you know that they, they are restricted. They have bounds. That there are places that they don't go or things that they don't do because they're just afraid. And when you're afraid, you're in bondage. So it's suffering. And thus the Bible says, be not afraid, for I am with you. Be not afraid. I am with you. And don't let anybody tell you that you're being contradictory when you say, I fear the Lord. Well, I thought you were supposed to love the Lord. If you fear him, why, why do you serve him? Yeah, I wouldn't serve nobody I was afraid of. It's a whole other definition of fear. We fear him because there is reverence for him. Reverence. The awe of God, the almightiness of God, and his presence and strength in our lives. So fear the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That is your best route. And that's all I got for you today. <laughs> I, hope, I hope I answered the question, though. But I like to get these questions because it gives me a, a, an a, avenue to travel down that, that is kind of foreign to me. I can't read up here. I can't do what I just did. But I do it. You know, I can do it, but I say I can't do it. I don't like to do it. Let's put it that way. It restricts me. I can't do well if I can't move around. So, anyway. That's enough of my problem. But I hope that answers the question. And I'm, if, if there's something else, just let me know. You can get, catch me afterwards, and we can go deeper or we can find some more scripture. But fear not is really prevalent in the Bible. It's throughout Old and New Testament. God does not want us to be afraid. He wants us to be free. For whom the Son set free is free indeed. And we're free because of his love and salvation for us. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that you give us these avenues, that you show us how we can live our lives in peace and in harmony and be of a good, sound character and moral standard. So, Father, help us to be the best that we can be. Guide us in the way that we should go. But, Father, help us to be bold enough to share that with those we come in contact with. Help us, Father, to give of ourselves to those who are in need. Help us, Father, to be available for those who have questions. Help us, Father, to just serve other people for you. Your word says when we've done it to the least of these, we've done it to you. So, Father, we just pray for that boldness to step out and to be free to serve others. And we ask, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you go before us and behind us, keep our feet on that narrow path of righteousness, guiding us in the way that we should go, and helping us to be the best that we can be. We thank you again for this day, this time of fellowship, this togetherness, Father, and we ask Father, in the name of Jesus, that we would look forward to that best that's yet to come. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.